The years 493 to 553 Common Era, a span of time commonly referred to by present-day scholars as the Ostrogothic period, was a period of great social upheaval within the Italian peninsula, which saw an incoming mostly barbarian army led by the Ostrogothic King Theodoric the Great settle and govern the former Roman regions of Italy. Magnus Flavius Enodius, a Catholic bishop working in 6th century Pavia, wrote numerous numbers of epigrams, an ancient genre of poetry characterised, among other things, by their brevity and elegiac metre, which present his perspective on various aspects of life in Italy at that time. This essay will examine the discursive effect of Enodius's gazing as seen through five poems treating as many barbarianised or queered subjects. These are Peregrine, Jovinian, Uxorcola, Odovacar and King Theodoric. These epigrams, when read together, suggest that Enodius himself, even if he never made such views public, associated attempts to integrate Gothic and Roman cultures with the infertility of deviant sexual practices, which he metamorphosized through the double entendre of a sower unable to disseminate the fatherland's soil. Enodius exhibits in these epigrams, which each present his personal outlook on five objects, a queering gaze, which by conflating ethnic and sexual alterity can render its subjects. Queer. Enodius's life began probably either 473 or 474 common era in Arles, and following his parents' death he was raised by his aunt either in Pavia or Milan, until she died and he moved into the house of a pious and wealthy family to whose daughter he was engaged, although Enodius later left her to pursue a career in the church. Being anointed first as deacon by Bishop Epiphanius of Pavia, whose vita Enodius would go on to write, Enodius would go on to become the Bishop of Pavia in turn. Both phases of Enodius's life, his membership in a wealthy family and his ecclesiastical career, provided him a rich classical education and knowledge of secular and Christian writers alike, which is reflected in the highly sophisticated nature of his writings, which use complex syntax and obscure vocabulary, perhaps in response to the barbarian, the barbarian traits in other contemporary authors. It is known from Menodius's epitaph, which is depicted on the screen now, that he died on July the 7th, 521 Common Era, and was buried in San Maggiore at Pavia, where the aforementioned epitaph actually still stands. Today, we have 95 surviving manuscripts containing Enodian texts, of which 12 contain his complete works, which suggests the copies in later medieval manuscripts derive ultimately from a compiled volume produced posthumously by a personal secretary working for Enodius. Within this volume, however, it's difficult to identify which texts were disseminated during Enodius' lifetime, although some, such as the panegyric composed for King Theodoric, were obviously intended for a public. This paper will therefore approach Enodius's poetry with the understanding that some of his views manifested therein may not have been openly stated. Since Enodius's epigrams to be analysed here respond to and gaze upon barbarians, a brief survey of the context of Ostrogothic rule in Italy is necessary here. The Western Roman Empire as a political entity ruled by culturally Roman emperors and senators famously fell in the mid-6th century Common Era to invasions by Germanic barbarians led, among others, by the warlord Odovaca. The Italian peninsula specifically, where Enodius resided and wrote, was reconquered from Odovaca in 493 Common Era by a man from the Gothic Amal dynasty who had been raised as a hostage in Constantinople. This, of course, being King Theodoric the Great, and he was sent with the blessings of the Eastern Roman Emperor Zeno. Having learned from the invasions of the previous Gothic King Alaric, Theodoric knew that the Goths would have no stability within Italy unless they were incorporated into Roman society, both legally and culturally, and this led the monarch to present in his date papers, which were compiled by Cassiodorus Sanator in his Varie, a picture of harmonious coexistence between Romans and the incoming barbarian soldiers, owing to their unique capacity relative to other barbarians of Theodoric's Amal dynasty from among the Goths to defend and cultivate Roman culture, which hitherto had been fading under Odovaca's rule. Theodoric the Great attempted to assimilate himself and his Gothic soldiers to Romanitas or Romanness in a self-effacing manner through rhetoric, which is seen chiefly in the aforementioned state papers. Um, and another contemporary source which treats this is the so-called Anonymous Valesianus, which is an anonymous 6th century text preserved only in a single 9th century manuscript. 
and this indicates the extremity of the Theodoric's rhetoric and his actions in his efforts to Romanize his barbarian subjects. Although it's lengthy, this section of the Anonymous Valesianus concerning Theodoric is worth quoting in full, and I will read my English translation of it, although showing the Latin on the screen, because we will be reading a lot of Latin in this video. Um, so what this means is, For Theodoric had directed Faustus the Black as an ambassador to Zeno, but when, with his death being known before the legate returned, Theodoric entered Ravenna and killed Odebaca, the gods confirmed Theodoric as their king, not accepting issue from their new prince. For he was a most bellicose and strong man, whose father Valimir was called king of the Goths, and was his biological father. And his mother Ereleva, called the Gothic woman, was a Catholic who was called Eusebia in baptism. Therefore he was excellent and good-willed in all things who ruled for thirty-three years. Happiness followed Italy in his time for thirty years, so much that there was even peace for the travellers. For he did nothing wrongly. Thus he governed the two peoples, Romans and Goths, as one, and although he was indeed of the Arian sect, he didn't try to do anything against the Catholic religion, exhibiting circus games and amphitheatres, so that he was called Trajan or Valentinian, whose eras he succeeded, even by the Romans and by the Goths, according to his edict, by which he constituted the law, Theodoric was deemed the strongest king of all. He decreed that the military should be for Romans just as it had been under the princes. He bestowed gifts and grain doles, and although he found the public granary filled merely with hay, he recuperated and made it opulent by his labour. Though he was illiterate, he was of such wisdom that some things which he said are held in the vernacular language even to this present day as a proverb, whence we have not neglected to put some of these many things into commemoration for posterity. Theodoric said, Whoever has gold or a demon cannot hide it, and also a miserable Roman imitates a goth, and a useful goth imitates a Roman. So... That's a very long quote from the anonymous Valesianus. And in describing Theodoric's bellicosity as his primary virtue, this text assigns him the social role which Theodoric himself prescribed for his Goths in the so-called Edictum Theodericarum, which are all the um, Edictum Theoderici, the Edict of King Theodoric, which is, and the social role which prescribed for the Goths in that text is that the Goths were to replace the Roman army and to be adjudicated according to military law, while native Italians would perform civilian roles such as paying taxes, and they were to be judged according to old Roman law. The Anonymous Valesianus focuses in its description of the King Theodoric on those circumstances of Theodoric's family and upbringing which made him less barbarian than his ethnicity might suggest. So, for instance, despite his heretical Aryan faith, which was associated so strongly with the Gothic ethnicity in the time that it was even called the Ecclesia Gothorum, the Church of the Goths. Despite being of this Aryan faith, Theodoric doesn't do anything, according to this text, the Anonymous Valesianus, against the Catholics, amongst whom his mother ranks. So this quote reveals the extent of Theodoric's transition, and liter this is literally in an etymological sense, because the word transition comes from transitio in Latin, coming from you know trans and uh, iter, meaning across and journey. So in a sense, this quote reveals the extent of Theodoric's transition, his journey across into Italy, and by proxy Romanitas, because despite his barbarian bloodline and his heretical Aryan faith, Theodoric passes, not only as Roman, but as the great emperors Trajan and Valentinian, because he performs the same acts of public munificence in distributing food and sponsoring circuses as these emperors did. In the archaeological record, there are indeed inscribed pipes and commemorative plaques from King Theodoric's infrastructure program alluded to here. Materially, it would appear that King Theodoric was providing that abundance and fertility alluded to in the anonymous Valesianus. So what I am saying here, in a crude sense, is that we can use transition and transgender metaphor as a useful tool for, or a lens by which we can look at the processes involved in Ostrogothic assimilation into Romanitas under King Theodoric's government. And this assimilation succeeded due to a plethora of factors in King Theodoric's personal life as we've outlined above. 
ordinary Goths or Im immigrant barbarians in Italy who may have been subsumed under the label Goth or the looser term Scythian, they did not have these same advantages. And by virtue of being unexceptional, they were interpreted by 6th century Italians primarily through the lenses of classical models for ethnicity and sexuality, to which I'll now briefly turn. Although a full treatment of the ways in which Romans conceived of ethnicity and sexuality is beyond the scope of this video, it's necessary to outline the most prominent and common aspects of their thinking on this matter. From the beginning, the Goths were an alterous category of people in Italy, but the extent to which their barbaritas or barbarianness was immutable is actually unclear. Greco-Roman ethnographers, such as Pliny the Elder, held that barbarian gentes, which are people or tribes, the word gens is quite controversial in terms of how it's translated. Some people would translate it as race, but I wouldn't recommend that personally. Anyway... Some Greco-Roman ethnographers, such as Pliny, said that barbarian gentes, living away from the Mediterranean, were unable to establish civilization and urban living like the Romans had, because the extreme heat or cold of their climates rendered them unable to control their primal urges as civilized man could. So these resulted in barbarians from regions outside the Mediterranean being perceived as closer to the natural world and therefore less civilized. However, this was not a trait passed down through one's stirrups or bloodline from generation to generation. If a person's environment changed, the Romans believed that a person could change with it. So in a word, barbarian assimilation to Romanitas was, at least to some contemporaries, a possibility. And it's one which Enodius, which we'll see in these poems by him that we're going to analyse, is very keen to foreclose for all but the most exemplary case of King Theodoric. This concept of control over baser impulses linked to ethnicity also lay at the heart of Greco-Roman understandings of deviant sexuality, which in turn related to gender roles. Classical scholars have traditionally studied the relation of Greco-Roman sexual performance, and quickly note, this is distinct from sexuality, sexual performance. Both Latin and Greek notoriously lack terms equivalent in meaning to the present-day English words for sexuality, such as gay or straight, because these describe an enduring pattern of attraction, which is just not a social role that the Greeks or Romans recognised, although they had terms for their own kinds of social, uh, sorry, their own kinds of sexual and gender roles. So, um, the the. Classical scholars have traditionally studied the relation of Greco-Roman sexual performance to gender using what is known as the Priapic model, which is why we've got some uh, depictions of phallic deities and uh, Priapus on the screen. According to this model, the unmarked vir, which is a man in Roman society, was one who is capable of self-control, which was taken as indicative of an ability to rule others. And you might remember from before that this ability to control one's impulses was also at the heart of the Roman ideas of what made a good ethnicity or a civilized ethnicity. And this capacity for self-control in a man was manifested sexually in restraining his desire to seek sexual pleasure by resorting to passive activities. It, the Romans, it appeared, assumes that passive sexual activity was just naturally preferable to everyone. The Romans seem to have assumed that everybody, or at least all men, would have enjoyed botany. Moreover, virilitas, which is virility or manliness, was a status which had to be maintained and was not guaranteed by one's biological sex. And we can see from the workings, for instance, of Raywin Connell writing on masculinities and hegemonic masculinities, how this is a feature of masculinity which endures even to the present day that um all natal males at some point or another are going to be expected to perform masculinity but not all natal males in fact probably not even most of us succeed in performing masculinity and it is also not an enduring stable status it must be hegemonic masculinity must be maintained almost fought for sometimes literally fought for and it was just the same among the romans it was a state, virilitas, manliness among the Romans, was a status which had to be maintained. It was not guaranteed by your sex. Possessing a phallus did not automatically make a person a vir. Only the appropriate use of said phallus in penetrating others. Thus, both a person's ethnicity, as either Roman or barbarian, 
and their gender as either vir or less than vir in late antiquity were products ultimately of their self-control. These these products of their self-control, their ethnicity and their gender, were influenced also by other factors such as climate. And we can see this manifest most evidently in control of people's own sexuality in their active performance. In relation to the Ostrogoths specifically, their military associations left them vulnerable to accusations of being consumed by violent passions, which made them suitable as warriors, but therefore also not as in control of themselves in a way similar to passive homosexuals. So hopefully you can see here how the fact that the Goths, by virtue of being a Germanic people from a northern, cli northern climate where they are unable to control their humours, the body in response to the excessive cold produces an excessive heat and they become too bellicose, too warlike. This, because it represents a loss of control over one's um, emotions by the rational mind, this to the eyes of Romans, such as these um, sort of mounted fighters in this picture, fighting the hairy bearded Goths in this uh, sarcophagus, which was created in the 3rd or 4th century, I believe. Hopefully you can see how the Goths' bellicosity became viewed, or could ha well have been viewed, in Ostrogothic Italy as effeminate, which, even though that goes against present-day notions in Western society, where we associate violence with macho hegemonic masculinity, for the Romans this would have been viewed as a kind of effeminacy because it represented loss of control over the Goths' emotional impulses. And, like I said earlier, the poetry of Manius Felis and Odius, who is living through Ostrogothic Italy and comments in his poetry on the Ostrogoths, is a, this poetry is a really good way to interrogate some of these ideas and how this gender stuff works. And let's actually go on to read them now and talk about all of the gay stuff that's in Magnus Felix and Odysseus' poetry. And um, just a quick note about it, that, you know, Magnus Felix and Odysseus, from what we've seen, he was probably either straight, yeah, probably straight, or maybe asexual. He doesn't seem to be interested in same-sex activity himself, as in from a perspective of performing it. So we must bear in mind with all of this that these poems are looking down on homosexuals, eunuchs, goths, etc. Um, and therefore, these are going to be biased in certain kinds of ways. We'll unpack some of the factors that go into that here. Um, and let's start by reading this poem about Peregrine. <coughs> because, well, Theodoric's two proverbs that we mentioned earlier, um, those proverbs show the extent to which Theodoric and presumably the citizens who adopted his proverbs, he wished the Goths to assimilate so badly. That same sentiment at play in the first proverb, the proverb where he says, a miserable Roman imitates a Goth and a useful Goth imitates a Roman. The sentiment in that proverb undergirds Enodius' view of the Goths. Enodius basically thinks that a barbarian cannot hide through his imitations the demon of his bloodline. And the subtext of one of his epigrams about a eunuch tribune by the name of Peregrine walking about everywhere, which is a very curious title. Um, the, the subtext of one of these po poems implies that for Enodius, a goth imitating a Roman is not useful at all. And I'm not going to read out all of this for you, but we're going to look at certain lines here which are more indicative than others. So, and also forgive me if I mess up the Latin pronunciation a little bit. In rita dicta valant ad celto non benedullus, non la fide sexum de tegit ad patriam, mendicus vetrus timidus confusus annelos, is verum perens utere nominibus. So, what these means are useless sayings abound. No seminator ad celtor um, comes nor does fidelity uncover his sex or fatherland, or reveal his sex or fatherland. Liar, doted, coward, confused, breathless, and this is Anelos' sort of like 
you know, sissy, effeminate, um, lacking a true name, use these names, basically. Um, now, what on earth does this mean? Connecting between this epigram's subject, so that this would be the eunuch called Peregrine, and the immigrant Goths can hardly have been lost in a Roman audience. There's lots of subtle dog whistles, almost, that Herodias uses to portray this this eunuch as somewhat of a barbarian. The name Peregrinus in Latin is both a technical legal term, which was a choice influenced, no doubt, by Herodias' work as a lawyer, and the term Peregrinus meant somebody who is not a Roman citizen, but it's also an adjective that means foreign, so this word is doing double duty here. Peregrine's title, Tribunus, refers to a high rank in the late Roman military, and this in turn implies that Peregrine may have been Gothic in identity despite being given a Latin name here, since Goths often also bore Latin names. Because most of the recent Gothic immigrants will have come in with King Theodoric's army. This foreignness is further strengthened by the line Nulla fidel sexum deterira patriam, no fidelity uncovers his sex or his fatherland, because this line explicitly links the sexual alterity, the sexual otherness, with ethnic foreignness, and implies that Peregrine is at best of unknown ethnic origins. This contradiction of an unearned or inaccurate title is a tension at the heart of this poem, and the inner dicta, the useless sayings which Enodius derides here, could well refer both to the aforementioned inscriptions boasting of Theodoric's renovation works and to Peregrine's formal military title of tribune. An agricultural dimension to this titular contradiction is evoked when Enodius says, Ad certor non venit ullus, no seminator arrives, in which the word ad certor as a double entendre simultaneously evokes the image of an active sexual participant ejaculating, and of a, a farmer, a cultivator. A righteous Roman ruler, deserving of his military titles, is a seeder or a breeder, so Enodius must shatter the illusions of rank for any like like Peregrine, who may have rejoiced at the prospect of barbarians with imperial support reconquering Italy. Or rather, not necessarily Peregrine rejoicing, in order this is addressing an audience, perhaps, of Romans who might have bought into the false title, who might have seen a, a Gothic man called Peregrine, a Gothic eunuch even, called Peregrine, with a, a Roman title of a military tribune, and Nordis is saying these are in rita dicta, they are useless sayings. This is that you, you are not getting what you're being promised by these Goths. And in this poem, Enodius is essentially clocking this military tribune to use the trans vocabulary. And by extension, Enodius is clocking any largely Gothic gothic based army who this man leads as a barbarian army and not as roman and in so doing enodius employs a common trope in late antique literature of depicting eunuchs as incapable and their promotion to high office being a sign of social decay to deride peregrine's deviant ethnicity under the guise of attacking his deviant body type so in other words these kinds of almost anti-barbarian, anti-Gothic sentiments, which may not have been easy to express publicly about the Ostrogoths, given that they were, at that time, the ruling political force in Italy. Enodius gets away with that by linking Gothicness to Peregrine's eunuch status and attacking the eunuch status, which is a common trope in classical literature. So he uses... Peregrine's deviant body as a stand-in for his deviant ethnicity by linking the two in this poem. And this choice by Enodius serves to further discredit Theodoric's efforts at Romanizing his Gothic army, since the king continued the Byzantine practice of eunuch military leaders as part of his Roman performance. So the fact that King Theodoric appointed eunuchs to lead his um to fill ranks in his army, that's part of Theodoric trying to Romanize his Gothic army. And Enodius in this poem is calling that out and saying that's actually false. It doesn't deliver the goods of Romanness. Goths imitating Romans are, to Enodius, as useless as 
Unix. Let's go on now to a shorter one, which is Enodius's epigram about Jovinian. The othering project which Enodius is engaging in is a reaction to the mixed social climate of Ostrogothic Italy, one in which people performed identifiers of either Gothicness or Romanness fluidly, depending on which was more expedient in a given social context. Said miscegenation means degeneracy in Enodius' eyes, and this is evidenced by his poem, which is entitled about Jovinian who showed up on one occasion when he had a gothic beard dressed in a cloak. And I will read this out for you now. Again, forgive me if I make mistakes with my pronunciation. Barbaricam faciem romano sum cultus, miraret in modico distinctas corpora vigentes, romuleam te gentem nox ordes nubila fuscat, opresit vestes tenebroso tegmine vultus. Nobilibus dolis genium male comte la gernis, discordes missions in lim cofedere proles. Which means, I'm amazed that a barbarian face takes up Roman attire, and that distinct peoples are in one modest body. Your mouth's gloomy night darkens Romulean clothing, your face presses your clothes with a shadowy cover, you wear a bad hairstyle with noble cloaks. May you differ, mixing discordant offspring in a foul alliance. The implication of this poem's first line suggests that Jovinian is identified by Enodius as Gothic, and therefore his taking up Roman attire is an insulting form of cross-dressing. Enodius' invective against Jovinian, as against Peregrine, is to show through this epigram that Goths cannot fully act Roman, or if we interpret it as meaning that Jovinian is Roman, it can have the exact same meaning, that Romans cannot fruitfully act like Goths. A miserable Roman imitates a Goth, after all, as King Theodoric said. Since the word facies, which is used to stand in for Jovinian in the first line, can mean both face and appearance, Anodius may be intimating that barbarian bodies look different even in Roman costumes, which again evokes the elements of clocking that so often get applied to trans people in the present day, highlighting the usefulness of trans language as metaphors to help us understand the ethnic climate in Ostrogothic Italy. Once again, this time under the guise of aesthetic taste rather than moral outrage, in this poem, Enodius implies that Romanitas, performed by the wrong actors, is this kind of destructive transvestism. The Gothic beard ruins the Roman clothing which Jovinia impairs it with. This aesthetic critique employs a crude form of stereotyping, which is by, well, by then well established in Roman literature and art, namely of depicting Germanic barbarians invariably as wearing a Phrygian cap, Having, wearing animal pelts in the full beard. And we see this statue of the praying German, some of these traits on display. We see the military cloak, we see a beard, we see the famous Swabian knot hairstyle, which was believed to be sort of stereotypically Germanic. So, here, in as in the epigram about Peregrine that we just looked at, the connection between ethnicity and sexuality is made apparent in the last line, where the final word brales, usually referred to as offspring, stands in as a metaphor for Gothic and Roman fashions, but by extension for the Gothic and Roman people. Because, unless this is referring to children which Jovinian, which Jovinian has, of both Gothic and Roman parentage, it doesn't make sense, right? Mi mixing offspring in an unfriendly alliance. What this must mean is it must be referring to the mixture of Roman and Gothic fashion. But Enodius is explicitly linking this, eth this ethnic style of dress with sexuality and with reproduction and a failure to do so in an appropriate manner because these offspring are mixed in an unfriendly alliance. Likewise, Enodius weaponizes 
Germanic fashion to attack another of his targets in the epigram about an adulterous and soft man. Now, I actually already have a video about this on my channel entitled um, An Ostrogothic Transbian. But I would maybe walk back some of the claims that I made in that video now. Um, it's a fascinating poem still in so many different ways. Um, I won't read out all of it necessarily, but I will tell you what this means that we have on the screen to uh, save time. Actually, no, I'll read it because it's fun. <laughs> um, why not? Again, forgive me if I butch the Latin pronunciation. Omnia memfitis retinendra secula textis. Servi vid nunquam laurentius ante neroni, nec timuit validas vicit qui corpore flammas, vira facie mullir gestus et crure corambo, Georgia naturae nullo discrimine solvens, es lepus et tanti conculas galla leonis, esige mendaces populorum zorcula barbas, ne munuant questum mascula labra tuum. Respice portentum per mixto iure creatum, communis generis satius sedicitur omnis, ludit in ancipici constans fallacia sexu, femina cum patitur per agit cum turpia mas est. Now what this means is, all the ages are restrained by memphitic garments, and that's from a city in Egypt, which implies sort of degeneracy to some extent. Lawrence was never a slave to Nero before, nor was he afraid who overcame strong flames with his body. A man in face or appearance, a woman in behaviour, um, destroying nature's divorces indiscriminately on both legs. You're a hare, and you trample such a lion's neck. Get rid of the people's lying beards, O oh wifey, of lest masculine lips threaten your moaning or threaten your claim. Look at the aforementioned creature, said to be of any every common gender. Persistent fallacy plays in its two-faced sex. Although he submits like a woman when he acts disgracefully, he is male. And that line at the end, I find so interesting, those last two lines, mazes, that need to say it's a man in a dress. The gender discourse is not um, advanced much in 2,000 years, or 1,500 years, I should say. So, let's, let's dissect this poem. Enodius does not name this person, so I'm calling them Uxorkala because that's a sort of that's an insult that Enodius throws at them in this poem. Um, Uxorcala basically means wifey. And Uxorca Populorum, in queer translations that I've done of this poem, I translate it as public property wifey. <laughs> like a wifey who belongs to the peoples, basically. Um, but just know that this is probably just a nickname. This person probably wasn't actually called Uxorcala. Um, the entire epigram here is just like those epigrams about Peregrine and Jovidian, which came before it, this epigram is concerned with uncovering the true identity of people who in some way transgress social boundaries. The subject of this poem fits into the classical trope of the chinedus, which may have been a rhetorical construction or a term used to describe the activities of a small group who are resistant to Roman masculine norms. And the chinedus is a sexually passive male prostitute. Enodius's characterization of Luxorcula as a lepus, which is a hare, it draws likewise on the aforementioned Latin literary tradition wherein Terence uses the term lepus as slang for a passive male homosexual in one of his plays, and also where Donatus the grammarian describes this animal as hermaphroditic, and this idea of hermaphroditism ties into homosexuality. The image in Enodius's epigram of a hare trampling a lion's necks, and also lions are an animal associated with sexual dominance in Greco-Roman metaphoric language. This image of Exorcla as a hare trampling a lion's neck, it may imply that Exorcla is seeking extramarital sexual partners among gods with large bushy beards like lion's manes, such as the aforementioned Dovinian. The line, 
mira facie mulia gestu, sed crure quorambo, it has no verb, and so it must be understood as taking the next available verb in the poem, which is es, which is thou art, or you are. And the use of the two nominatives, mira and mulier, man and woman respectively, to govern a singular verb, encapsulates that same disgust as in Enodius's poem about Jovinian. Just as Jovinian was a goth acting Roman, Uxorgla is a vir, a man, acting like a woman, a mulier. And note also, I have a video on a one of my Latin tidbit videos called an, a Transvestite in Early Medieval England, um, which describes in very, very similar language, um, say, saying that this person was plus vir de facie, more of a man in face, et pectore, and in his chest, but who enjoyed womanly things, etc. That early medieval English text goes on to describe. So it's this really interesting um, tendency to locate or to locate an indication of true sex in a person's face and the way they look. And I don't think this is insignificant, for instance, that in medieval sign language, the sign for man was pretending to stroke a beard. This physical act was so powerful that it could stand in as a symbol for the entire male sex. Not unrealistically, since natal males tend to develop facial hair more often than natal females, in the male in the human species, that is. Um, but it is very interesting how this, this um, I guess, focus on looking at the face of a natal male performing femininity as a means of distinguishing his true identity or their true identity from that of a natal woman seems to, this, this seems to be a trope that we have in literature from the Ostrogothic period from that um, 8th century text from early medieval England this seems to be a sort of I guess instinct in western culture when we encounter gender non-conforming natal men to look to our faces as the sort of true window to who we are um which might explain some of the politics around analyzing trans women's faces and also around quote-unquote facial feminization surgery but that's a topic for a whole other video anyway so like i said enodis is writing this poem to make Uxorcala's gender clear by rehashing a phrase from the first Latin epigrammatist Marshall, who described passive homosexual sex as muliebria pati, which literally means to suffer womanly things. So there's already that association, which we still have in uh, the LGBT community in the present day, of male passive sexual behaviour. So essentially bottoming, taking dick, as womanising in some way. Enodius takes that same language and rejoins it with an emphatic statement at the end of Mars est, he is male. In Roman literature, pejorative commentary on male cross-dressing behaviour, which is typically but not always associated with these passive sexual acts, pejorative commentary on male cross-dressing behaviour still ultimately categorises its subjects as feminine men whose overlap with womanhood existed only in the context of insult or for a, a temporary phase of life. And this is why I'm being cautious now not to refer to uh, Uxorcala, for instance, as a uh, transbian, even though I think that trans can be a useful metaphor to think through it in some aspects. I think we need to be we need to be aware, especially with this kind of literature, which is not written by a person who we might now refer to as LGBT. This is written by somebody from a judgmental perspective towards Uzorkula, and so it's extremely sort of skewed and slanted in its portrayal of her, or of this person. My point being that this kind of pejorative literature, like Enodis's poem um, on an adulterous and soft man, this poem is still classifying Uxorcala as male, despite their feminine behaviour. And this categorization is simultaneously produced and enforced by that rejoinder Mars Est, because it presudes the possibility of a genuine transition, as in of Uxorcala as a natal male, a male-bodied person, 
which this poem seems to imply that they are, transitioning and living as a stable, uncontested life within the female social role within Ostrogothic society. This, these two words, mazest, simultaneously produce and enforce um, that that is impossible because it acknowledges the risk. There'd be no need to emphasize that Xorkla is a man if it was inevitable and self-evident, as the biological sex of Xorkla would be from the title of this poem, De Arotero et Mole, because Arotero is the masculine or the neuter form of that, um, of the adjective adultera. So, Enoris, so, um, Uxorkla's biological sex is obvious from the title of the poem. So, the, there is no need to say he is a man. That is an that is a redundant line which Enoris is throwing in precisely because Uxorkla's homosexual behavior and Uxorkla's possibly cross-dressing behavior. Um, and I should note also that there's not maybe as much evidence for cross-dressing here. Just to can in some cases meet, um, refer to clothes, but in this case it's behavior, it's performance really. Um, although he seems to be implying that Uxorkla is shaving with a line about get rid of people's beards. Um, so that's interesting. And there could be some cross-dressing behavior going on there, as is often associated with passive homosexuals in Roman literature. Now, how does this relate to the Goths? Enodius discursively links Exorcla's body to the Ostrogoths and possibly to Ostrogothic royalty specifically through the imagery of facial hair. Even though a moustache appears to have been worn rarely by Romans and not necessarily by all or even most Goths, from the aforementioned poem about Jovinian, it's evident that in Ostrogothic Italy, the stereotypes of Goths wearing a barba or a barba, barba gothica, which in Latin could mean beard or a moustache, as we see in the medallion of King Theodoric, um, where he is sporting a moustache, as would many of his descendants, as a sign of noble Gothic, Ostrogothic ancestry. This word of a gothic beard was strong enough that an audience could use it in the title of that poem and people would instantly understand what he was referring to. A gothic beard, in other words, was clearly a thing. So in symbolically associating Uxorkula with this symbol of, with the facial hair as a symbol of barbarian aesthetics, Enodius transfers some of the moral disdain for passive homosexual behaviour in adult males onto the Gothic people who wore their facial hair in this way. So in other words, Uxorkula is a bearded passive homosexual male who has to keep shaving their beard in a constant performance of effacing their own barbarianness in an attempt to appear Roman. And Enodius, by calling out that contrary to their gender performance, Uxorkula is in fact a man, there is a metaphor there also because um, Uxorkula's performance of gender in shaving is linked to a Gothic ethnicity because facial hair was such a strong symbol for Gothic identity. In this same line, Enodius is critiquing Ostrogothic culture and Ostrogothic identity and linking it to deviant sexuality. In other words, if the moustache is taken as a recognisable symbol of noble Gothic masculine fashion, Uxorkula's shaving of it can be read as an effort not only to assimilate into a feminine social role, but into a Roman one, like Jovinian does in the poem that we looked at earlier. So when we read them together, these three poems that we've just done on Peregrine, on Jovinian, and on Uxorkula, they reveal that for Enodius, the attempt to blend or pass between Gothic and Roman ethnicities is like cross-dressing and sexual immorality. Both of them ruin the more noble state, which is Romanness and masculinity respectively. And both kinds of cross-dressing or sexual immorality should be refuted by educated Romans such as Enodius, who were able to see through the facade 
able to see through the facade of a crossdresser and of a goth pretending to be a Roman. Now, we are going on to a very interesting poem about Odovaca. And if, but before we do, a few words about the context of this poem, which is entitled about the deceased prince, the drunken deceased prince who would wield a fine staff. The king mentioned is unlike to be King Theodoric, given that the negative description in this poem would contrast very heavily with the high praise which Enodius lavishes upon Theodoric in the panegyric he wrote, wherein he depicts Odovaca's rule before Theodoric's as corrupt and fruitless in contrast to Theodoric the Great's. In addition, the poem's title suggests that this poem's subject ruled before the present king Theodoric and never attained the title of rex or king. The use of principe here may be a strategy on Enodius's part to effeminize this epigram's subject by intimating that this prince still belonged to the slippery point, this age in which youth may fail to achieve manhood and slip into degeneracy. A more likely interpretation is that this poem describes the rule of Odovaca, a barbarian whose precise ethnicity is disputed, and who at one point led the Germanic Foederati, which are the Confederates. These were bands of mercenary troops comprised of non-Roman citizens who fought in the Roman army. However, following the assassination of the Roman general Orestes, upon his failure to grant the army those permanent settlements which they desired, the, the Foederati soldiers elected this guy, Odovaca, as king, not as emperor of Italy. And he then promptly dethroned and exiled Orestes' son Augustulus in 476 Common Era, which signalled the de jure death of the Western Roman Empire in the eyes of many historians. And indeed, under Odovaca's rule, the Germanic Foederati seized whole thirds of Roman lands, as recorded in Cassiodorus's Variae, and many of them married Roman women to raise children of dual heritage. All of this historical context is very important to understanding this poem, um, which deals essentially with Enodius's concerns about a usurper of power being unable to properly seminate the land of Italy. And we've, saw, we've seen some of that theme above in the epigram about Peregrine, and it becomes much more clear in this poem on the foregone drunken king who would wield a vine staff. Now I'll read this poem out to you. And then I'll give my translation on it. Verdos honor de vitem tribuit sed munera vites, ye uno non dant linea ministerio, ut ceptrum princeps si gesta dextra vitem, ut tribus exordne titiva corona caput. Eo quotidiens calidis vitis sine frune la fuge la belli, in lucit nudo nomine me reforvens. Um, goodness. So, that's the first bit. And then Enodius has a second bit, which he addresses to the honoured prince. Um, and we'll have a look at this bit as well. Terrarum culpis vitium putator of umbras, eblius es inequis, vinam vomens ligurum. Tum replet maridus fervencia pector abacus, in the convalidam pocula nostra sitim. Now what this means is, true honour bestowed you a vine staff, but you avoid its duties. Sticks don't provide to the hungry man through ministry. The prince waves a vine staff with his right hand like it's a scepter, and adorns his head on both with both hands using a divine crown. Alas, so often he mocked me with a naked name, um, rekindling with he with with heats the vine staves lacking in tender lips fruit. It's a very difficult syntax here to pass. And then that's the first bit describing the prince. And then Enodius's poem speaking directly to the prince is. He is judged by the land's faults on account of the vine saves shadows. You cannot be drunk spewing out the vines of Liguria. While moist Bacchus 
refills fervent chests. Our cups indicate great thirst. And I've included, by the way, here, this is not a picture of, this is not a stone, gravestone of um, anyone in Ostrogothic Italy, um, or even of Odovaca, but it shows this man holding a vine staff, which, as we'll see in a bit, was an important military symbol for the Romans. So, a few words about this poem itself. The historical context that we looked at earlier, it no doubt undergirds Enodius's concerns about usurpers, like we see in this poem, being unable to disseminate the soil, because Enodius had seen barbarian usurpers who showed no interest in maintaining Roman traditions, violently seized territory within Italy to the impoverishment of Roman aristocrats such as himself. This poem draws on a republican cultural tradition with a long precedent in Roman society, wherein monarchical rule was considered a pathway to tyranny. Enodius, in his education, was exposed to some of these ideals from reading Republican-era texts such as Cicero and Sallus, and these will no doubt have soured his perception of monarchical powers exercised in his lifetime, with Theodoric, as usual, being the one exception, owing likely to his greater proximity to Romanitas, as we described above. Indeed, this poem depicts a prince, like we said, probably Odovaca, who is more interested in reveling in the riches of his usurpated status than in meeting the needs of his people. And as with the previously discussed poems, Enodius is concerned with pointing out his subject's true identity. The line, Verdos honor vitem tribuit, true honor granted you a vine staff, refers to a staff which centurions in the Roman army carried as a symbol of rank and also as a phallic tool with which to discipline subordinate troops, which marks the status of the prince wielding it as false relative to the true honour of the legitimate emperor who promoted Odovaca to said rank. And notice how this contrasts, we'll see this in, in the poem to come, this contrasts with King Theodoric being granted the royal regalia by the Byzantine emperor Zeno. The line immediately following plays perhaps on that phallic symbolism which the vine staff's shape invites us to think about. It says, Yeo non non dant linea ministerio. Sticks do not give to the hungry man through ministry, because just as the infertile phallus cannot produce offspring, the, the penis attached to the homosexual man cannot in this time period produce offspring. The vine staff which in the hands of a Roman can, can participate in Romanitas, seminate the soil, reproduce um, Roman culture. In the hands of a barbarian like, a king, like Prince Odovaca, it becomes just a flaccid stick who can, in the hands of a usurper who can't use it to produce anything. So this poem is saying that, that the physical trappings of Roman power don't actually enable um, Odovaca to seminate the Roman soil and to flourish and provide for his people in the way that he is supposed to. And we see this contrasted a lot in the very last poem that I want to talk about in this video, and I know it's been a very long one thus far. Um, there's even more in Enodius that I could go on about. He at one point laments the fact that he no longer hears the masculine language being sung in the fields um, because all of these barbarians have come in, sort of implying perhaps that the Gothic language had some feminine implications for him. There's so much going on in in, in Odysseus' writings. Um, but we'll focus on one last one to round off the this video, which is the poem De Hortu Regis, um, On the King's Garden. Because in this poem, the metaphor of the vine staff as a sterile phallus con is contrasted with King Theodoric's blossoming branch, which we see described in this poem. Now, I'll read out part of it for you um, and then give my translation of it. So, Dexterta bellipotens vulgatis plena triumphis, qua cecidit quicquid fugit ab obsequio, disperso celsum solidas quis sanguine famam, Cui pepperet laudem mitis et arma tenens, posquam per largio rubuistis de mate campi, arva colis pingens de mine purpureo. <laughs> 
virgosis proprio dispensas mordice pomma, tas plantis fructum noble tate tua, villior en jespes jactat sed divite vamo, dum lini morsus semina clara favet. Now what this means is, the war mighty one fled from complacence with a right hand full of cheapened triumphs by which anything fell. Now this is referring, I believe, to the death of King Odovaca. With bloodshed you consolidate those things for him whom the mild armiger begat praise and the highest fame. Afterwards you blushed before the field's great garland. This is referring to King Theodoric. Painting the field with purple seed in a wicker basket. You dispense fruit to the shrubbery with your own purple dye. You give fruit to the plants with your nobility. Nobilitate tua. Wow, a lowlier turf shows off with a wealthy branch, while the tree's sting nurtures distinguished seeds. The exuberant fertility of Theodoric's rule exhibited in this poem stands in direct contrast to the harsh sterility of political power under Odovacus. Whereas Odovacus vine starves are described as lacking in fruit, Theodoric literally gives fruit. He literally ejaculates imperial authority, the purple colour of his seed being that of the highest ability since republican times in Roman culture. In Enodius' poem on Jovinian discussed above, even if the word proles is taken to refer to Jovinian's actual children, those offspring only exist within a foul alliance, whereas the fruits of Theodoric's rule and his offspring will blossom in a garden of regenerating Romanitas. Even the violent military role associated with the Goths is euphemized as an agricultural tool in this poem. Um, Theodoric is the tree's sting, lini morsus, like a phallic plough in the Italian soil, nurturing semina clara, distinguished seeds. King Theodoric remains exceptional. He is the wealthy branch, the divis, diviteramo, of an otherwise lowly soil as ethnicity. In his ability to rightly exercise control over himself, which is applied by two adjectives used to describe him, mitis, which is um, mild, and armatenens, arms bearing, so even though he is a military person, he is a goth who does this fighting role, he is mitis, he is mild, and Theodoric is controlled. Like a man, he has control over his emotions. And like a Roman, he has control over his emotions. In Roman political thought also, which is seen through the writings of Seneca the Elder, among others, what distinguished a king from a tyrant was actually his mercy, his mild-heartedness, which is implied by the, by the word mitis there. In this poem, therefore, Enodius is contrasting Odovaca's violence with King Theodoric's restraint. Theodoric has power, but because of the proximity to Romanitas his upbringing bestowed him, his transition, like we said before, into Romanness, Theodoric has the restraint to put power to use in fertilising the Italian soil and producing offspring, offspring which, by the way, may have well been, and Odius may be referring to things like this, to restoration of the waterways, as part of that, the fruit that King Theodoric produces from his metaphorical garden. Theodoric has the restraint to put power to use in fertilising the Italian soil, maybe with those waterways, and producing offspring, producing fruits, rather than merely using it to satisfy his base desires, just as the passive homosexuals indulge their base desires. So to conclude, Enodius' obsession with boundary transgression and miscegenation has to be addressed a little bit. This preoccupation, which we see most strongly in the poems about Jovinian and Uxorcula, but I would argue it's in all of them, this preoccupation with boundary transgression could well be another product of a loyally mind for whose work the discrete definition of social categories was very important and for whom anomalous exceptions were a worrisome thing. But to focus on this alone ignores a vital function that Enodius performs in decrying what he believes to be his poetry's subject's mistaken identity claims. In other words, what does it matter if somebody wrongly claims that they're a Roman or that they're a man? 
or that they're a woman even. Namely, the fact that Nodius is abjecting the gods, and I use abjecting here in the sense of Julia Kristeva, the fact that he is abjecting the gods in the process of constituting and reaffirming Enodius's own identity as Roman. This is why the only barbarian subject whom he praises, King Theodoric, is the one who is most fully assimilated to Romanitas. Theodoric acts the most like a Roman, so much so that he was called a Roman emperor. He said he, people said he was like the Roman emperors. Um, goodness, I'm forgetting the names now, but um. <laughs> He passed, essentially, as from an emperor like Valentinian. And that's the only goth whom Theodoric, sorry, whom Enodius praises in his poetry. Enodius was writing at Pavia in an Italy of Ostrogothic and Roman miscegenation, wherein Roman and Gothic were neither consistent, stable, nor mutually exclusive modes of being, as Patrick Amory points out in his book People and Identity in Ostrogothic Italy. In an age when no set of characteristics were exclusive to Goths or Romans, Enodius and Theodoric alike can only constitute themselves as Roman in the action of objecting and scorning the Goths, whom they also simultaneously reify. From my reading of the five poems previously discussed, I propose that Enodius does not view and construct his barbarian subjects through a gay gaze, or a queer gaze, as Steve Druckmann formulates it. This is... In queer theory, the idea in which the ego passes what it perceives for male objects soft enough to invite scopophilic pleasure-taking in their beholders. But rather, Enodius appears to experience mostly disgust from this kind of gazing through epigram on all but the most exceptional of his objects. The only pleasure, if he derives any from the poems that we discussed, he might derive a bit of pleasure in mockery, which is common to the genre of epigram. Instead, my proposition is that, in this poetry, Enodius constructs his barbarian subjects through a queering gaze, which, drawing on Greco-Roman sexual mores, interprets all forms of ethnic and gender deviance as deriving from the same sexual failure, from a lack of self-control, which characterises queer lifestyles. It is this gaze which equates the awkwardness and the failure of pairing a gothic beard with Roman cloaks to a male crossdresser with visible stubble, and therefore Enodius in these five poems formulates Ostrogoths as an inherently queer social category. <laughs>